Well, hello, and welcome to Kamloops Alliance Church. My name is Tim, and I'm the pastor of spiritual formation here. And today, uh, I get the privilege of uh, co-preaching with my wife, Melissa. Yes, I'm so excited to be here and to talk about marriage. I'm a mother of three, pastor's wife, a leadership coach. I also volunteer in our life group ministry as a coach and teacher to support our life group leaders. And you also may have seen me up here singing with the worship team. But I'm super excited and privileged to be here serving in this way with my husband as we talk about marriage. And I hope that as we share a little bit about our story, that it would encourage you and support you in your marriage. Yes, and that is what we are here to talk about today. We are in a series called Relatable, God's, Desi God's Good Design for Relationships. And so last week, Pastor Chris talked about the meaning of marriage. And today, we're going to talk about the making of a great marriage. And so we're going to show you how flawless and perfect and amazing our marriage is. Why are you laughing? Uh, okay, obviously that's not the case, but um, we want to bring you in a little bit, uh, kind of a living room chat, if you will, um, and share some things from our life that um, uh, we hope resonate with you and help you in your journey and your marriage. Um, yeah. So we want to ask, where are you at in your marriage right now? Are you still in the honeymoon stage? Are you flourishing? Maybe you're barely surviving. Maybe you're at the stage of life with young kids and you feel like ships passing through the night, just no energy or time for each other. Maybe you've been doing this thing for a while and now maybe stuck in a rut or plateaued in your relationship. A little bit about our story. Our honeymoon stage didn't last that long. It was non-existent. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as the engagement ring went on the finger, honestly, all hell broke loose. We had pretty ugly conflict. It wasn't good. And two weeks before our wedding, we even discussed canceling the wedding. But we really felt um, that we were called to get married. And there was peace in our heart about getting married, but we committed to counseling immediately and for the first year of marriage. Um, and God has been growing us, shaping us, stretching us all through our 13 years of marriage so far, and He is continuing to do so. Yeah. So for the message today, we want to kind of center ourselves in Scripture on Matthew chapter 19, which Pastor Chris talked about a few weeks ago. We're not going to go into all the details and stuff he did, um, but we're going to talk about verses 4 to 6. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you have your Bibles, turn with us. Matthew chapter 19. We're going to use this passage as kind of a springboard. We're not going to do your classic exegetical uh, sermon, um, but uh, we will use it as a springboard to talk about some things we think that are important and helpful for um, marriage. So will you stand with us as we read God's word? Matthew 19, 4 to 6. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. You may have a seat. In this passage, we see a unity of two people under God's power. God is the glue that brings them together. And I, I love that this passage uses the word joined. Uh, I dabble in woodworking, and woodworkers uh, talk lots about what, this thing called joinery. And joinery is simply actually the bringing together of two pieces of wood. And there's a multitude of ways to do that. There's classes and textbooks and conversations and online chats and videos all around what are the best joints and how do we come together, how do they come together, and what glue to use and what technique to use and all sorts of different stuff. And there are many different kinds of joints. There's basic butt joints, miter joints, half lap, mortise and tendon, biscuit, pocket, rabbit, uh, dovetail, box joints, and many more. What workers get into disagreements about is around what joint is the best, the strongest joint. And there's arguments and disagreements and discrepancies on how to use what joints when. 
So here's the connection, is that the argument that the scripture is, is making is that um, the best way for uh, um, a marriage to come together, two people to unite in marriage, is actually through um, the power and calling of God himself. That God is the glue that joins two people. The interesting part that this passage uh, kind of points out is that it titles this coming together as one flesh. And um, when you put two pieces of wood together, when you, if you just glue them together, if you try to rip them apart at the seam, um, they don't rip apart very nicely. It's not like Velcro that just goes together, glues in, and rips apart. If you glue two pieces of wood together, if you try and rip them apart, they will come apart, but it'll actually rip pieces of the other wood off of it, and you'll actually damage the wood itself. And it'll take a lot of work to repair it. And this is the picture actually that's happening in the one flesh principle. That actually the two become one. And, and if you pull them apart, if you separate them, um, actually there's a lot of damage that can happen uh, that's really hard to repair. And so this passage is saying, hold on, God is the glue bringing them together. And don't pull these apart. Because once they're apart, there's a lot of damage that can happen. And so the question then becomes, how do we keep these things together? What does it look like for us to be joined in holy matrimony um, through the power of God? Well, here's what I want to point, about, point out about this passage. There is a significant layer in this passage that is actually showing us what the gospel is, the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel always starts with the initiation of God. It's not us saving ourselves. It's not us making ourselves presentable to God. It's not any of those things. While we were still sinners, Paul says, Christ died for us. In other words, God initiated uh, reconciliation. God initiated redemption. God initiated, he moved to, he was the first mover. He moved towards us. And so the same is true in marriage, that actually God is the initiator in marriage. He is the one that calls us together. He is the one that brings us together. And then there's another piece in there that it says, let no one separate. And the interesting part is in the gospel, sin is a separator. Sin is actually what drives a wedge between you and God. Sin is a wedge that is drived between um, all people, not just in marriages. And so there's this, this picture actually that's being woven here into this passage that yes, this is about marriage. Yes, this is about God bringing two people together in holy matrimony in a unique covenantal relationship. But also, it's actually a reenactment of the gospel. And Pastor Chris talked about this last week. And so today we actually want to go deeper into this principle and talk about three ways we can reenact the gospel. And so here's what they are. A healthy marriage reenacts the gospel through repentance and forgiveness, grace-empowered service, nurturing fondness, and admiration. Let's start off with the first point. A healthy marriage reenacts the gospel through repentance and forgiveness. Do you have hurt, pain, conflict in your marriage? Sure question. We all do. It's a normal part of relationship. It's a part of the human condition, whether it's big or small. So how do we deal with this? Well, repentance and forgiveness is at the core of the gospel. In Colossians 3.13, it says, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. The reality is that we all do wrong. We don't even meet our own expectations of ourselves. Paul says it this way, why do I do what I don't want to do? So when we do wrong, we own it. We confess, we repent. And through this repentance and the power of the Holy Spirit, we continue to improve ourselves. We become more Christ-like. We become a better person and a better spouse. As Gary Thomas says it in his book, Sacred Marriage, you don't fall out of love, you fall out of repentance. But what do you do when someone has hurt you, has rejected you, ignored you, sinned against you? You practice forgiveness. You may have read articles out there about how 
detrimental unforgiveness is to us, our bodies physically, mentally, emotionally. You know, for unforgiveness leads to bitterness and resentment and to contempt, which we're going to talk more about later, how destructive contempt is in a marriage. Unforgiveness is scorekeeping. This goes against how the Bible defines love in 1 Corinthians 13, that love keeps no records of wrong. We forgive because it's hard to love when you harbor bitterness and unforgiveness towards someone. So I'll own it. I can be prone to unforgiveness, that bitterness, that resentment. It often comes from unmet expectations, funny enough, from ones that are even uncommunicated. But the common storyline is something about, oh, woe is me, I'm carrying the brunt of the family responsibilities. It's the scorekeeping. I'm doing so much. What are you doing? She does do so much, most, <laughs> most of it, actually, yeah. But I build up resentment. And then I see it starting to show up as being easily angered, impatient, divisiveness, feeding into my entitlement and my pride. And there's a wedge and there's a distancing from Tim. It's, that, it, it's actually awful. But when I choose forgiveness, there's freedom and reconciliation. There is a desire for closeness again. There's a rekindling of intimacy. And that distance that was created from that unforgiveness and bitterness begins to close. We engage with this marriage journal as a weekly practice in our marriage. And you can buy one of these from the church. We do have these in stock if you're interested. And part of the weekly practice, there's, there's six questions. And one of the questions is, is there any unconfessed sin, conflict, or hurt that we need to resolve or seek forgiveness for? What have I've, I've appreciated about this as a regular practice for us is that it creates an opportunity for forgiveness and confession on a weekly basis, which can happen more often. But it doesn't allow unconfessed sin to um, come between us, unforgiveness to come between us and fester and grow. Which is easy in the busyness of life. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. And so this has been a great touch point for us um, as we grow. Um, in our marriage together. A healthy marriage has a regular practice of forgiveness and repentance. So the next point is that a healthy marriage reenacts the gospel through grace-empowered service. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate service. <laughs> I'm just, just being honest, just putting it out there. I'd much rather go to the beach, put my toes in the sand, and have someone bring me a drink. In fact, did you know that if you go on a Disney cruise, that they actually come and cut up your kids' food for you? Now that is service that I would like to receive, not do. <laughs> uh, and so I, it, this is actually a, a real struggle for me. I, I'd rather be served than serve. But here's the interesting thing about service. That at the core of the gospel is a countercultural statement about what it means to be human and what it means to find human flourishing. That the world tells you, actually, you find flourishing by, by getting, by taking, by receiving, by, by just being a vacuum and sucking everything into your life that you can and kind of filling and ballooning up. But the problem is, is if that's true and you bring two vacuums together, you don't get two people who actually fulfill each other. You get two people who are just a bigger, more powerful vacuum and suck the life out of everything around them. And so service doesn't actually work to actually bring fulfillment, or sorry, uh, not service, but, but um, trying to uh, be someone who receives rather than gives, doesn't fulfill a marriage. It actually just creates a void in a marriage. And so um, you have to ask the question, how do, why, and how does service um, help a marriage flourish and be healthy? Well, it's because of this. When we serve in a healthy way, what it does is it creates a healthy rhythm of putting the other person first. 
Now you have to ask yourself, why and how can I do that? Because we all need things. We all need to be filled. We all need energy. We all need help. We all need love. We, we are still needy people. And so the reason why we call it grace-empowered service is because it helps us to identify where our motive comes from. We don't serve um, because our wife or our husband deserves it. We don't serve um, because there's somehow something I'm getting out of. Uh, it, it's, it's not spouse-empowered service. It's not spouse-deserving service. It's grace-empowered service. And so the reason for the service is not coming from the other person. The reason for the service is coming from God. That actually, as human beings, we were designed and built to get our fulfillment from Jesus himself that he is the one that fills us with his goodness, that fills us with his truth, that fills us uh, with his healing and his forgiveness. And as we begin to overflow out of relationship with Jesus, actually then service becomes this beautiful, selfless act that I get to serve the other person, not because I'm looking for something in return, because I, I don't need something in return, because I'm already serving out of the overflow. So here's what this looks like in practical lens. So a few weeks ago, I had a challenging day at work. I come home and uh, I, I just got a dark cloud over my head. I, I'm wrestling through stuff and I, I just, I'm stressed. My energy's spent. I'm kind of done. We sit down, we have dinner, which Melissa made. And our typical routine is that after dinner, we clean up the kitchen, we get the kids ready for bed, they go to bed, and then we kind of, you know, do a few more things and do whatever we have planned for the rest of the night. And we kind of push through that after dinner phase where we're all kind of tired and we kind of get done what we need to get done. Well, I'm just in a funk this day. And after dinner, I'm, you know, I got the dark cloud over my head. And instead of cleaning up, instead of helping with the kids, I, I wasn't even really thinking, to be honest, I just found myself on the couch doing, you know, the finger dance with the phone, right? Just, just scrolling through stuff mindlessly. And I know I shouldn't be there. I know that I should be cleaning up. I know I should be helping with the kids, but for whatever reason, I just am struggling to get my butt off the couch. And as I'm scrolling through my phone, I can see out of the corner of my eye, Melissa comes walking out of one of her kids' bedrooms and walking down the thing, and I'm going, uh-oh, hope she doesn't see me. And of course, sure enough, I see that she turns and sees me out of the corner of her eye, and she stops. And inside, I begin to cringe, and I begin to kind of formulate my defense of what's coming, right? I justify why I'm sitting here and doing the thing I shouldn't be doing. And as I'm scrolling through, I'm, I'm cringing, I'm waiting to defend myself and justify, which, you know, is obvious, of course, it's going to go well, not. It's going to cause a blow up and whatever. But instead of doing what I thought Melissa was going to do, she actually stops, she waits for a second, and then she comes and she sits down beside me. And now I'm thinking, oh, I'm really gonna get it now. Not only, she's, just, she's not just reacting out of me, at me out of frustration, she's now got premeditation. She's thought about it for a minute and now she's coming and she's gonna like slam me good, right? And I'm sitting there waiting for it, but instead of doing that, she puts her arm around me she begins to massage my neck. And she doesn't say anything. Now, here's what I know is happening. I know Melissa likes to talk with me. That's how she connects with me. It, it, so she's wanting to make a connection with me for herself. She's gonna come sit down and chat, talk about her day, debrief, whatever, try and make use of this time for her. But she also knows that I like to be with her in silence. And so she's sitting there She's massaging my neck, which is something she does when she's trying to connect with me. And she's not saying anything. And immediately, this calmness just comes over me because I realize she's serving me. She's not trying to get something out of me. Although, to be honest, she would have been totally justified in doing so. She would have been totally justified in sitting down and said, "Hun, I know you're stressed, but get off your butt and clean the kitchen or help me with the kids or do something, right? Like that, that would have been justified in the moment because that's what we had previously agreed upon doing. Instead, she massages my neck, she sits there quietly with me, and just actually watches what I'm surfing on my phone, which I don't even know what is, is useless stuff. She sits there for a good minute or two, and then she asks, how you doing, hon? And I just then felt connected with her, and I just said, ugh, I'm just, I don't, 
I'm distressed, I'm frustrated, I just don't even know what to do right now, yada yada. I spewed for about 30 seconds, and then I was like, and I just said, thanks for, you know, putting your arm around me, and I threw my couch on the, uh, threw my phone on the couch beside me, and I got up and I started cleaning the kitchen. She didn't need to do that. But she clearly saw a need in me, and out of her overflow, her lack of insecurity in that moment, she came and served me. What does service look like in your marriage? How do you use service to make each other flourish, to bond, to connect? How do you serve grace empowered in your relationship? Let's explore the third point. A healthy marriage reenacts the gospel through fondness and admiration. When you get married, you often see your spouse through rose-colored glasses, but it can change, and quickly sometimes, to gray, maybe even black. What you saw as lighthearted, easygoing, always up for a good time, now you view as uncommittal, lazy, never taking things serious. Or maybe what you saw as hardworking, intensely caring, and always there for you, you now see as controlling, insecure, and suffocating. The Gottman Institute says that contempt in a marriage is the greatest indicator of divorce. In fact, the Gottman Institute can predict divorce with a 90% accuracy, and contempt is their top factor. Contempt is a feeling that a person is beneath consideration, worthless, deserving of scorn. So that can show up in belittling, name-calling, treating the person as less than. Contempt is fueled by long-standing negative thoughts about someone, uh, fueled, fueled by chronic bitterness and resentment. So I want to ask, where might you be harboring contempt for your spouse? And how do you counteract that? The opposite of contempt is fondness and admiration. So how do we get there, Tim? So how do you turn contempt into fondness and admiration? You look at your spouse through the same lens that Christ looks at you. When Melissa and I were first engaged, I looked at Melissa through the same lens that I looked at myself, which was a lens of judgment and criticalness. I didn't realize it at the time, but I had actually a fairly high level of expectation on myself that I don't think any human really could uh, meet. And as a result, I was fairly critical uh, and, and judgmental of myself. And, and I think Intuitively, I understood that as I put the ring on her finger, that the, the two were about to become one flesh. And so actually, I, I turned that inner critic towards Melissa. And, and it turned into, as Melissa already pointed out, um, you know, nasty arguments and, and uh, th conflict that accelerated. And we just kind of went into a tailspin. In fact, I, I often say our engagement, which was only four and a half months, was the worst four and a half months of my life, uh, which is kind of weird. Like, why in the world did you get married then? Well, I should point out, we prayed, we brought people in. We felt like we, we kind of had to humble ourselves and, and, and people kind of loved on us and prayed with us and, and saw us through those moments to help us see what was going on. And as we went through counseling and as I leaned into Jesus and, and took you know, day, spiritual retreats and, and prayed, God began to reveal to me my critical heart. And I began to realize that actually I wasn't viewing myself in the same way that Christ was viewing me, nor was I viewing Melissa this way. And so as God began to work on my own heart, I began to actually realize that I wasn't um, accurately assessing Melissa and who she was. And I wasn't, certainly wasn't looking at her through uh, Christ's lens. And so um, I began a journey of trying to unpack this and, and, and change um, uh, this lens I was looking through. Psalm 139, 14 says that humans are wonderfully made. 
Have you lost the plot on God's finely tuned creative power when he built your spouse? Your spouse was created wonderfully. The Gottman Institute says that in order to build fondness and admiration, you must be able to see the positive in your spouse. In other words, um, in order to get out of contempt, you got to be able to reframe the negativity you have in your mind in, in a positive sense. you got to be able to see um, the, the good things in your spouse. And unfortunately, our world makes that hard to do. Because we're so focused on ourselves, we, we actually often miss out on the positive things. But here's the interesting thing. As Christians, we have the best justification for seeing the positive in the other person. They were made by God. Every human being is loaded with creativity, beauty, design, intention, purpose, and God's image. Do you see it in your spouse? There might even be potential and things within your spouse that they don't even see in yourself that maybe God brought you into, their, into a relationship with them so you could draw that out of them. What are you missing in your spouse? What are you not seeing? What lens do you have that's blinding you from being able to see the positive in your spouse? Just like I was blinded by my own criticalness and my own judgment. Mm -hmm. Tim and I were establishing our purpose, our mission, our values for our family. And we started off with a poster board and we wrote each of our spiritual gifts and strengths uh, side by side. And we looked at it and we laughed because we were complete opposite. And we acknowledged that those opposites have created tension and frustrations between us in our we, marriage. We didn't see them in a positive light. <laughs> But knowing that God brought us together for his purpose, a common purpose, we began to appreciate the differences in our gifts and abilities. We started the conversation and asking each other, how do our strengths act actually supplement each other rather than conflict with each other? This has been powerful in our marriage. We have shifted the lens from annoyance with our differences to an appreciation of the unique and beautiful gifts that God has given to each of us. So I ask you, what negative thoughts or perspectives do you have towards your spouse that need the lens of Christ put over them? Mm. You know, it, it's, it's easy to appreciate sameness, right? But it's harder to appreciate difference. I think that's where we were at. Mm -hmm. So the main idea today is that a healthy marriage reenacts the gospel through repentance and forgiveness, grace-empowered service, nurturing fondness and admiration. Um, Pastor Chris and his wife, Krista, uh, are going to be doing a Q&A uh, on the podcast. So if you have questions, I want to encourage you to text uh, the number on the screen here uh, as uh, um, they would love your questions and want to answer uh, them as much as possible. Also, um, we really believe, most of us are strongly, uh, strong believers in getting help. I think every marriage, honestly, should have a mentor, uh, someone who's helping you along. And Melissa and I have benefited and been blessed um, over the years by many great mentors in our lives. Uh, sometimes together for both of us, sometimes working on things separately. Um, but we've, we've been really blessed that way. So as uh, KAC, we actually offer uh, marriage mentorship as a ministry. And so we have people who are trained and ready to help you. Uh, so you can actually go online, canvaslines.com, click on ministry, click on marriage ministry, and under there, there's a form that you can fill out and sign up for marriage mentorship. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. You can also purchase these journals uh, through the church, um, and they will help you build a rhythm of connecting with your spouse. Um, I don't know about you, but Melissa and I, unless we put it in our calendars, it doesn't happen. Um, we get busy on doing other things, and so we have to make this a priority. When I got into woodworking, some people said to me, uh, you know, Tim, or they began to ask uh, the people who were in the know, they said, Tim, do you like detail and like slow processes? Uh, 
And I laughed and said, no. <laughs> and they kind of looked at me like I was crazy because they're like, well, yeah, but that's fine finishing woodworking. Like it's different than construction. Fine finish work, woodworking is detail and slow processes and sanding the same board of wood for a long time. Do you enjoy that? And I said, well, like, yes and no. There's pieces of it I enjoy. But actually, honestly, there's pieces of it that are really hard for me. And part of the reason why I want to do it is because, because I know that my soul needs it. I know that uh, my soul needs to slow down and appreciate small details and slow change over time. The bringing together of two pieces of wood is slow, can be cumbersome, can take time to do it well. And this is true in marriage. The two people coming together can be slow and cumbersome as we work through our own brokenness, our own hurts, our own hang-ups, our own uh, um, struggle to kind of actually come together. But God is at work in your marriage and in your life. And I just want to declare over your marriage today that it is God's power that is at work, that you do not need to rely on your own power, but that actually you can turn to God and by His grace, He will work something new within you if you would open yourself up to him let's finish off with a word of prayer lord god come and work in all our pain and brokenness of our marriages may your grace fill those places guard our marriages from the scheme of the evil one Continue to grow and develop us to be more like you, that we would have healthy and thriving marriages. Renew us, Lord, for your glory and for your kingdom. Amen. Amen. God bless you, and thank mm -hmm. you for coming today. God bless. Thanks so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the service. Uh, we encourage you to stay connected with KAC, and you can text connect to the number on the screen uh, and you will be uh, engaged in our texting service that will keep you up to date of all that's happening in the life of KAC. So make sure you get connected that way. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram uh, and we'll give you more information and updates and great content there. You can also visit our web website at camelsalliance.com for a plethora of great stuff happening here uh, at the church. Uh, we encourage you to come back next week uh, as we've got more great content, great opportunity to worship and gather together uh, as we learn to be relatable. God bless you and thanks for joining us.